All right, this is our last um, upper respiratory illness that we're going to talk about on this PowerPoint, and then we'll have a little cumulative review from this. This is a longer lecture, but I'm breaking up into smaller parts. And this is with our new textbook that we're using at my school. So I've updated a little bit, changed a few things around and also added in some application and other interactive questions and things like that. So let's jump right in. So influenza, this is something that, you know, around this time of year, we're thinking a lot about. Um, most people don't recognize that influenza is actually an upper respiratory infection. Um, and when I say infection, it's actually viral. I should say upper respiratory virus. Um, when we talk about um, other disorders, you know, they can be bacterial, fungal, or viral. This one is only viral. There's no influenza bacteria. There's an influenza virus. And this is upper respiratory. So most people think influenza, they're thinking it's in their lungs, but this has nothing to do with their lungs. And that's a very important thing to note because if I start to have a problem with my lungs and I have influenza, I'm actually probably experiencing a complication. So definitely something we want to pay attention to. So um, it's upper respiratory, so all my symptoms are from here up. Um, and um, flu season runs from September through April. So right now we are in the peak of it. Um, we are in, I am in January right now when I'm recording this. Uh, it is actually just the beginning of January. Um, and this flu season has been pretty serious uh, between COVID, the flu, and RSV. It's been a pretty rough one. Um, so we're seeing a lot of flu this year, but um, every year is a little bit different. Um, flu A and flu B are the most common and cause the most problems, as you can kind of see. Um, what do you call it? Um, a and B uh, as a whole, uh, what do you call it, um, are going to be the most common that, uh, you know, that we're going to see around. So usually when they swab you, when you go into the emergency room, they're checking you for A and B. Um, so the problem with the flu is, is that every flu season is different, so it's unpredictable. They do the best that they can to make a flu vaccine that's going to help to cover. And I'll talk about this more, but the flu vaccine is not there to stop you from getting the flu. The flu vaccine is there to stop you from dying from the flu. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is it can lead to a more serious secondary bacterial infection, just like we just talked about with um, acute sinusitis. Um, I can get influenza, but then if I start having lung symptoms, a lot of times I'm getting a secondary like bacterial pneumonia or other, um, you know, issue in my lungs, bacterial infection in my lungs. So definitely something I want to pay close attention to. Um, and it's also highly contagious and requires a droplet isolation. Now, these days with, um, you know, being, you know, COVID pandemic, post COVID pandemic, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, we, um, you know, we're still wearing masks in the hospital at this time. And so around patient care. And so we're already doing droplet isolation, but we definitely want to be super careful, especially people that have a lot of extra secretions and things like that. Um, Hallmark symptoms of influenza are going to be things like high fever, body aches, and sore throat. So this is a little different than some of the other upper respiratories we talked about. We've had ones that have fever, like sinusitis, um, but you know, we usually don't have the other systemic symptoms. So the other systemic symptoms are things like body aches and sore throat. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can move forward. All righty. So, um, you know, there's influenza and there's also the common cold and people mix these up because they're both viral. And um, most of the time for common cold, uh, we don't, and, well, for both of these, we usually don't do a whole lot of treatment. They're usually self-limiting and they get better on their own. But what's real, the real difference here? So the big things to look at, and you can kind of look at this, it kind of does a side by side between the cold and the flu. But, um, you know, the cold, common cold has more gradual, mild symptoms. It's rare to have a headache or a fever with the common cold or the flu is is um, more common, has sudden symptoms and more severe symptoms. So it usually has a sudden headache, fever, and then severe aches and pains, extreme fatigue and weakness. So it's kind of like a common cold um, on um, hyperdrive. So it, it's very uh, much more um, sudden and much more severe, if you want to think of it that way. Um, we also can diagnose the flu by a nasal throat and swab, which the common cold, there are so many little viruses that can go around. A lot of times we can't even diagnose that. Um, so it's just something to kind of keep in mind um, in case you get a, uh, you know, an exam question that's asking you to differentiate these two things. A lot of times we differentiate them by, you know, getting an actual official diagnosis and then also the symptoms that they have. So how do we know a patient is getting better that has influenza? A patient with influenza is getting better if they have 
um, improvement or, or decreased um, symptoms like aches and pains if they're feeling less weak, less fatigued, or if their fever is going down or going away. Um, but the patient can be getting worse um, if they start to have those lung symptoms, like I mentioned, like everything should be here and up, like sore throat. Um, and when I say here and up, I know that there's body aches and things like that, but most of the problem is here. You know, they have the headaches, they have the sore throat, they can have kind of the general cold symptoms um, that are not fun, but um, they do have the systemic aches and pains and weakness fatigue. But the big key here is there's no lung symptoms. There should be no shortness of breath. Um, you know, there should be no difficulty breathing. There should be no change in their oxygen saturation. There should be clear lung sounds. So if they start to have any of those lung sounds, um, it's a sign that they're getting worse. So if they have those wet or coarse lung sounds, those wet sounds, um, it also could be crackles or ronchi could be another one you might have. That's a sign that there's something from up here, an infection up here has started to spread into my lungs. Um, difficulty breathing or changes in oxygen saturation, that can be another another sign that they're getting worse. Because again, I, if I'm having difficulty breathing or decreased oxygen saturation, it is a lung issue. It's not an upper airway issue. Now, I know sometimes you get congested, um, your throat's sore and swollen. It can feel a little like, you know, it might be a little bit harder when you're up walking around, but they shouldn't have significant difficulty breathing or um, really should never have a change in oxygen saturation from that alone. Um, and usually in a nursing school, because when we're talking about influenza, we're talking about the, um, you know, stereotypical hallmark patient who should have none of this. They should have no wet lung sounds. They should have no difficulty breathing, no oxygen saturation um, issues. They should have an oxygen saturation, but no oxygen saturation issues. Um, they uh, also, we would look for them starting to have signs of new or worsening infection. So if they have a new fever, um, like if something's going on, like they, their fever was gone or they never had a fever. Now all of a sudden they have one. Um, if their symptoms are getting worse, their aches and pains are getting worse. Weakness fatigue is getting worse. Um, any of their symptoms, their drainage is getting worse, changing colors, things like that. So yeah, so the, cause the big thing is, is that most of these patients, um, you know, they're not going to be, um, coughing, coughing up a lot of deep sputum because again, this is not a lung issue. Um, it's like a throat and above issue. And so most of the time they might have a cough with their um, influenza, but they're not going to really be producing a whole lot of sputum. If they start producing a lot of sputum, um, having a new fever, showing worsening symptoms, they could be getting a secondary bacterial infection. So uh, most treatment is just focused on managing the uncomfortable symptoms. And we've talked about a lot of these. We will talk about antitussives, but we talked in the, um, when we talked about sinusitis, we talked about, you know, the uh, pain and fever, same thing here. We can give acetaminophen. Um, we also talked about expectorants like wafiacin or mucinex that help to thin mucus and get secretions up. We can use those that will make the patient more comfortable. Um, but like I mentioned in the last PowerPoint, we can also, you know, um, give stuff to decrease their cough. So here's the thing about decreasing cough is we do not want to give them, we want them to cough stuff up if there's infection. We want them to get stuff out. But sometimes patients are having such a hard time with their secretions and their cough. It's keeping them up at night. They're not sleeping, they're exhausted and their body does need rest. So there are times if it's really affecting their ability to sleep, rest and get better, we will give antitussives for their comfort, but we don't wanna to rely too much on them and we do want them to get stuff out. So it's kind of a fine line there. Um, we won't have a test question that expects you to understand that and be like, oh man, you know, you should have known that, but just know that as a whole, when people have infectious stuff, or usually our first goal is not to keep the infection in, it's to get it out. Um, but um, for patients comfort, we can do that. Um, if there's only been one or two days of symptoms, we can give antivirals. So, and there's been some flu season. There was one, I don't remember how many years ago, like four or five years ago. Uh, it might've even been longer than that. We had such a bad um, flu season that we were given this, even if it hadn't been, if it's been more than one or two days, but just know in general, in real life, you know, we usually do not give this unless it's only been, they've only just started their symptoms. Cause the thing is, is it's only gonna be effective if we give it that early. And um, this is all Celtivir, um, which is also known as Tamiflu. Um, and um, this doesn't actually kill the virus itself, but it stops the virus from replicating. So it stops it from getting worse. So it can decrease the amount of time that you have to you know, suffer with the symptoms of the flu, but it's not actually going to kill the virus itself. Um, but again, that can only be given if it's been within a few days. So if you got a test question that say, hey, it's been three or four days, this is not gonna be an appropriate med. 
All right, so let's talk about antitussives, which are uh, medications that help to decrease um, uh, the amount that you're coughing. Um, so I have some, um, I have some mnemonics for some of the drugs here. Some of the drugs you might see, this is probably the most common one I give in the hosp hospital, these Tessalon pearls. Um, we give them pretty often. The other ones are a little bit, um, stronger, especially codeine. Um, we're only going to usually do that if it's very, very serious. Like I've had a patient that's on a ventilator that has like a lot of neurological stuff going on. And sometimes we'll give them stuff to literally stop them from coughing because their coughing is messing with their brain function and other things. Um, or if it's really affecting their ability to breathe or their respiratory status, then we might do that. But most of the time we're doing really like minimal stuff like this Teslon pearls. Um, like I mentioned, our coughing is a good thing. We want infection up and out. Um, most of these decrease the cough or the coughing reflex. Um, so again, it can be very serious. Um, so we want to make sure we're using these if we need to, um, but it's not gonna be our first go-to usually. Um, how do we know these medications work? We want decreased coughing, of course, that would be our goal, but there would be a problem. This one also has the double Ds um, where it can, like with expectorants, where it can cause drowsiness and dizziness. Um, uh, codeine specifically just because um, there's three different meds here that I have listed. Codeine is an opioid. Um, so there is a concern for addiction, but we also have to monitor the respiratory rate because just like if I gave morphine, it would have a similar effect. Um, and then we also want to make sure we're looking for signs that the, that the infection is not worsening. If I'm giving a bunch of cough suppressant and um, then their infection starts getting worse, I'm obviously not helping this patient. So I want to look for that new high temperature, those wet lung sounds, increased respiratory effort, work of breathing, decreased oxygen saturation, things like that. So as a whole, um, I should be coughing less, but also still getting better with my uh, infection and stuff like that. And then just looking for those signs of depressed reflexes um, when it comes to breathing and the drowsiness, dizziness in general. All right. So overall, what am I going to do as the nurse for this patient? Um, really, a lot of influenza management is about prevention. Um, but once they have it, it's about infection management and comfort. So um, we can teach good hygiene practices and there's the influenza vaccine, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, it's the best way to prevent it. When I say prevent it, I really mean prevent it from death versus prevent it from happening at all. Uh, managing infections. Um, and by the way, sorry, real quick to back up to hygiene practices, that's gonna be things like washing your hands, um, <coughs> avoiding crowded areas, things like that. Um, and so uh, avoiding sick people, those kind of things. Um, how can we manage infection? Um, we do the droplet precaution, like wearing the mask um, and the good hygiene practices, like I just mentioned. And then comfort, giving those medications we mentioned, like the acetaminophen, um, the cough suppressant if needed, things like that. Um, and the expectorants to get secretions up if they're struggling with that. Um, promoting rest and keep the patient hydrated as well. So let's talk about the influenza vaccine. So there's a new vaccine every year. Um, and, um, you know, the, in order to get this vaccine, a baby has to be at least six months to qualify for this. So anyone who's younger than six months will not qualify to get the influenza vaccine. So most people would think the highest risk people are going to be older people, but it's actually going to be healthcare workers, people that work in congregated areas like prisons, um, or people that work or live in congregated areas. So, uh, you know, people, older people that live in a nursing home are going to be at risk because they do those meals together. They're highly congregated, can get sick more easily. Um, but most people forget that healthcare workers and people that work in congregated areas are also super high risk. So they also um, should be at the top of the list to get this influenza vaccine. Um, it's important regardless of how you feel about vaccines and your own experience, because everyone has their own opinions and feelings around this, um, to educate people about the truth behind why we do vaccines, because a lot of there's a lot of misinformation. You know, I've had a lot of my family come to me and say, yeah, I'm not getting the vaccine because I always end up getting the flu. And you may get the flu, um, but you're not going to be a sick from the flu. And we find that, you know, most people that are vaccinated when it comes to the flu do not end up in the hospital on ventilators as sick with the flu as those that do not get the vaccine. 
Um, so it's, it's really just important about educating them. Like, cause a lot of people, again, they don't want to get it cause they're like, I'm just going to get the flu anyway, but they might not even have to deal with as many symptoms or as severe of, um, uh, consequences from the flu. Cause the flu can get super serious. I've seen some very young people get very sick and die from, um, being on the ventilator, getting lots of complications from the flu that led to secondary infections and respiratory failure. Um, it does take two weeks for full protection to occur. And yes, very commonly, because when people get the flu vaccine, it's the it's already flu season. And a lot of times people get it and then they get the flu before they, it, they get the full protection from it. So, um, but also know that once you get a vaccine, your body's building up a defense. So a lot of times you're going to get symptoms. So letting people know, hey, you know, you might not feel too good. I mean, most of this, the side effects from vaccines are just the discomfort. Um, like it might be sore on that side, um, have some pain discomfort. Um, they could also start, you know, showing signs of infection because again, your body's building a defense. Um, so just educating patients on that. Um, and there's two types of flu vaccines. There's what's known as the inactivated um, uh, virus, which is what most people get. It's an injection. Um, and then there's also the attenuated influenza vaccine, which is a live virus. Um, and the, the thing to keep in mind here, the most important thing for you to know is you don't choose which one the patient gets. Um, you know, a lot of times they do um, the attenuated for, you know, kids and stuff like that, that have really good immune systems. Um, but attenuated is a live virus, which means your body has to actively fight the actual flu. And so it's not going to be for those that have a very weak or suppressed immune system. So anyone that has like chronic illnesses, um, they're on immunosuppressants, things like that. They should not be getting the attenuated. Now, nine out of 10 people are going to get the inactivated, but it's just something to know because I have seen NCLEX like questions that talk about the attenuated, who is this appropriate for? And no one who has like, uh, who's chronically ill or has a weakened immune system or is on medications that suppress their immune system should be taking this. All right. That's what I've got for the flu. I hope this helps. So now we're going to do an overall knowledge check for all of this section. Um, so let's look what's next. So first we're going to do a knowledge check and do some matching. So we have got um, some different uh, oxygen devices and which we want to match it with. So first here we have nasal cannula. Um, we have non-rebreather, a venturi mask, and high flow nasal cannula. So we talked about oxygen back when we talked about anaphylaxis. So let's see what we can remember. So let's look at this first one. A can deliver precise concentration of oxygen. So I have to think about which one of these is precise. Um, so I think that the precise concentration was this venti or venturi mask. So then let's see, can provide close to 100% oxygen via nares. So I'd have to know what nares are. And so this is one that um what do you call it um it's it's delivering a lot of oxygen and it's in through my nose so i'm have two that have the nasal cannula on them but it's either the nasal cannula or high flow um general nasal cannula i think you can only give a little bit of flow i don't think you could go up to 100 percent. so i'm going to think that this is probably high flow nasal cannula but let's keep going most non-invasive option for oxygen. So I have to think about these. There's a mask here, this is a mask, and then there's two nasal cannulas. But this one's high flow, this one's not. So if this one is the 100% one, this one probably would be the most non-invasive one maybe. We'll see, let's keep going. This one says bag attached to this mask must stay inflated at all times. So the only other mask, I already talked about this venti mask is the precise concentration. So the only one I have left is this non-rebreather and that non-rebreather, think the B and breather, it has that extra bag attached. The B in the breather can be the bag that's attached. So this non-rebreather, I think D is the most appropriate. So nasal cannula should be C, most non-invasive option for oxygen. Non-rebreather should be D, it has a bag attached to the mask. It must stay inflated at all times. Um, Venturi mask is A, it can deliver precise concentrations of oxygen and high flow nasal cannula is B, it can provide close to 100% oxygen via nares. Hope that helps. So um, the next thing I have as a way to bring things together, um, most students really want to stick to just multiple choice questions. I got to tell you to take it to the next level um, and to really see what your knowledge is. Open-ended questions are the way to go. Now, no one wants to do open-ended questions. I know that they're harder, but they can be super helpful. So um, there's a couple open-ended questions here. Let's kind of look at these together. The first one says, 
A nurse is caring for a client with sinusitis who is having acute sinus pain. What can the nurse recommend? So this, like a question like this versus having options, this requires me to really think about this. Um, so it's great to see what I know. Now, if I look at this question, I'm like, man, I have no clue. That tells me, hey, I need to go back and look at this topic. Because a lot of students, they say, well, I don't want to do open-ended questions because, um, you know, there's no point in me doing that because I'm not going to have those on an exam. But really to understand the content on, where you can more easily answer the multiple choice question, open-ended questions are the way to go. So I love doing trivia in my class. Um, as time goes on, especially closer to the exam, I love doing trivia. I always say that week before the exam, that's time you should be doing open-ended questions versus, not, not saying do no multiple choice, but you should be adding in open-ended questions to really see how deep you know this stuff. So sinusitis, acute sinus pain, what can we recommend? So um, I always think about if I'm thinking about treatments, I think about medical treatments and I think about nursing interventions. So medical treatments, what did we talk about that can help with pain? Hmm, let me think about this. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to get some water. My water exploded. So um, sinus pain. So what medication do we talk about that can be used for pain? So there is um, acetaminophen. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, there's also, though, aside from that, we talked about those hot, hot packs that can help here. You know, we can put the warm packs along um, our face to decrease pain. Now, there was a lot of interventions for sinusitis, but remember, this one's asking about acute sinus pain. Some of the other interventions like the steam, the neti pot, sitting with the head of the bed elevated, um, those are going to help to thin secretions, get secretions out, but they're not necessarily going to be the, the first thing that's going to help with pain. So you always want to think specifically if I'm looking for help with pain, um, you know, which of these would be the best option. Um, so, um, you know, that might help to narrow it down. Now, the great thing about open-ended questions like this is this is just a start. So we're starting here, um, you know, talking about acute sinus pain um, and things like that. Um, but, you know, from that question, I'll be like, oh, okay, well, there's other interventions I can do for sinusitis in general. So in other words, you can take this question and make your own questions from it too. So I'll be like, okay, that's what I do for sinus pain. What do I do for um, congestion? What do I do for, um, what do you call it, um, the infection side of things when it comes to, um, uh, what do you call it, um, sinus pain? That's yeah, our sinusitis, excuse me. Um, so this can also helpfully help you helpfully help you to expand and go deeper into um, more things when it comes to um, uh, you know sinusitis and studying that as a whole. So the second thing asks, what would warrant a call to the physician for a client with influenza? So for influenza, we just talked about this. So there, there could be a variety of things. So we want to look for signs of worsening infection and signs of worsening with their breathing or their respiratory status, because there shouldn't be any issues with those. So I would say if they have a new fever, if there's something that um, they have a change in their drainage, um, that would be maybe some of that stuff. And then also um, when it comes to the respiratory symptoms, so change in their lung sounds, um, shortness of breath, work of breathing, oxygen saturation, any of that stuff as well. Um, so you can take a question like this too, though, and say, okay, that's what would warrant a, a call to the physician for influenza, but what would warrant a call to the physician for hypersensitivity? So then you can start making your own questions as well. Um, and I'm just starting to answer these. I might not be answering them fully, but hopefully this is getting you a start. Um, you can also pause me and see if you can answer them by yourself. And the last one is what assessments and monitoring need to be made for a client receiving um, acetaminophen. So the big thing with acetaminophen, I know is all about the liver. So um, assessments would be for their liver function tests, um, making sure that they are... Um, you know, their liver levels aren't going up, looking for jaundice. Then I would also say, you know, you always want to, like with any assessments for a med, you want to see, is it working or is there a problem with it? So to see if it's working, I would want to assess if they have a fever or not. I would want to assess what their pain level is and do a good PQRST. So um, those are the main ones that I'm thinking of off the top of my head. So hopefully that helped. Then also I have this next and last slide is what are three things to include in teaching for the following clients. This is the other thing to do. A lot of nursing school questions are going to be about teaching. So make sure that you're taking the time to think what you're gonna teach these patients, whether it's about medication or if it's going to be about 
um, something deeper. So I'm going to just throw out a few teachings for this, but definitely spend a little bit more time. I'm not going to do three for each. Um, I might end up doing three for each because I'm such a nerd, but I'm going to try, <laughs> try to let you fill in some of the gaps here. So EpiPen, if you remember it, you know, there's issues like we want to make sure it's not expired. We want to make sure that we're giving it in the thigh, that you may need repeated doses, that you seek help afterward, um, that your family knows how to use it, stuff like that. Diphenhydramine, that's Benadryl. Um, so with that, I want to teach them to avoid anything that's going to make them tired or drowsy, like stay away from alcohol, um, that it can have a paradoxical reaction like insomnia or excitability. Um, what else? And that if they have a dry mouth, they can use lozenges or candies, um, to help to, um, improve their dry mouth. Decongestants. Those are the ones that we don't want to use more than, what is it? Three day. I want to say it's three days. See, this is the thing I can teach this in five minutes later Then I'm like, wait, what, how many days? <laughs> so yeah, double check my math on this. But yeah, I think it's like, you don't want to use them more than three days. Um, and if, when I say double check, I mean, I literally had a PowerPoint about this. Like I did this like about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so um, I want to say, you don't want to use it more than three days or more than three to four times a day. Might've been four to five, but I want to say three to four times. I think it's three to four. I think it's no more than three days and more, more than three to four times per day it can make you dizzy or drowsy. Um, it's not good for people that have like cardiovascular, other conditions, things like that. I think that's what I would say for that. Hmm. Influenza prevention. So we just talked about this. So it's going to be like the hygiene stuff, avoid crowds, avoid sick people, wash your hands, get the vaccine. Um, and then allergic rhinitis education, a lot of the big thing, avoiding triggers. Um, you know, we talked about a lot of stuff you can do around your house. So it's going to be stuff like, you know, removing carpeting, not keeping plants or pets in your room, um, good ventilation. Um, you know, we want to keep it cool and dry, not too warm, um, things like that. So I'll stop there before I go too deep. But so as you can see, this is another good thing to do. And there's a lot more education that we've gone over. So it's great to go through and see if you can do like, act like a patient was sitting in front of you. Hey, I need to teach you about this. What would you tell them? What are some of those top three points? And it doesn't even have to be three. And what are the top points that you would want to give for that patient? So Hopefully this helped bring it together. I hope you're enjoying these new PowerPoints and that they're helping to get you bringing it all together. Um, anyway, that's all I've got for this time, but uh, there will be more to come soon. See you for the next one.